Mike has asked me to read the passages that we will be discussing today, and I'll try to uh, do them in order that he uh, wanted me to. <clears throat> First, uh, if you will turn to uh, Judges, it is chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it formerly. These nations are the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. And they were first testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. Next, we're going to look at uh, Psalm 10, verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Then finally, our main passage today from 1 Samuel. We're going to look at... Uh, chapter 17, and go through, I believe it is, uh, let's see, 11. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Succoth and Azekah in Ephes Damin. I hope I'm pronouncing these correctly. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head. And he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves, that is, shin guards, on his legs, and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Mike. Thank you, Warren. It's good to be with everyone this morning. Uh, last time I was here, I brought 15 copies of uh, John Flavel's Mystery of Providence. If you didn't get one of those and you want one, raise your hand. Let me have kind of an idea how many more I need to get. One two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, about fifteen. Okay? Uh, one of the most influential books uh, in my entire Christian life. It has to be one of the top ten books. And he explains the providence of God in a way that uh, is unique and fresh, even though he preached 300 years ago. Uh, you think you know the providence of God, and then he gives you things to really think about. And it's uh, relating everything backwards. The reason I wanted to introduce uh, Flavel, because we have a brand new publication of it, and secondly, uh, because Everything that we're going to see in these stories is all set up magnificently by the providence of God. It's the sovereignty of God is His plan from beginning to end. The providence of God is how that plan actually fits together 
and works out. So I'll bring you 15 copies next time and we'll all study this together. This is our eighth lesson on the rise of David, who is a king, but he has no kingdom. Before we get into 1 Samuel 17, this dramatic story that everyone knows in the Bible between David and Goliath, 54 verses of awe, anticipation, crescendo, and close. Before we put one toe into 1 Samuel 17, I want us to think about providence, the providence of God. And let me begin with this proposition. The Philistines should never, ever have been there. Ever. <clears throat> Such is the providence of God. Judges chapter 3, verse 1, these are the nations that the Lord left. The word left means to remain or to settle. It's used of the birds that settled or remained in the ark, Genesis 8, 4. Uh, Psalm 125, verse 3, the scepter of the wicked will not, in our word, settle or remain over the land allotted to the righteous. The Philistines shouldn't have been there in the first place. But that's a lesson unto itself. This message uh, that I'm beginning with was really designed for last time, New Year's, the beginning of a new year. But I'm long-winded and so I'm off track. But here we are. Look at this verse. Judges chapter 3, the Lord left. He let them settle. He let them remain. Now, why would He do that? Well, look at the remainder of verse 1. To test Israel by them, when God sent Israel into the land under the leadership of Joshua, they were to conquer it. It was their inheritance that had been promised to them by God. And they were to conquer it completely and totally. It was their promised land. And under Joshua's leadership, they took that land. Had a lot of early success. But as time went on, they grew lethargic and slothful. They were complacent. Unfaithful to take all, that's the key word, all, all of the land, the territory that God had provided. Thus, a considerable alien element of Canaanites settled and remained in the promised land. Well, what did the Lord God do in light of that fact? Did He shoot fire from heaven like Sodom and burn them all up? Look at verse 2. No. He left them. He left them for a specific purpose. That Israel might learn to fight. Now, what had Israel previously learned about warfare and battles? Well, the great battle that's recorded early in the Old Testament for Israel was the battle of Jericho in the land. And just exactly what it was that, Joshua chapter 6, they were given God's word of exactly what they were to do to conquer this formidable city, this place that no one would dare to attack. 
And interestingly enough, it really has nothing to do with the warfare as you and I understand it. That's important. The battles that we have are spiritual battles, not physical and material. We trust a sovereign God of providence to deliver. And that's what Jericho teaches us. Without swinging a sword or a spear or one man being bloodied, they were to one day go all around the city and the next two times and the next three times. We know the story. And then at the appointed moment, they were to blow the trumpets and shout and the walls collapsed. Teaching Israel and of course, moreover, teaching us that we win the campaigns of life by doing exactly what the Lord tells us to do and remain there until He tells us something different. But see, like all of us, Israel had grown complacent in taking the land and they dropped the warfare. Quick success gives us ease and makes us slothful and complacent and unfaithful to the Word of God. Oh, when times are tight and tough, you and I quickly get on our knees and we stay on those knees often and always. We're afraid. We're intimidated by the giants in front of us, whatever they may be. You say to your family, you say to your friends, look what I'm up against. But now... Look where you are. That's all behind you now. Those are victories that you won in the past. And you're in danger now of drifting. That's what Dan Duncan calls it. Becoming complacent. Drifting along. Here's the lesson. Judges chapter 3 that we looked at before we set one toe in 1 Samuel 17. Our warfare, our battle at hand is fight passivity. Fight it with all your heart. Keep close to the Lord. And therefore the Lord will stay close to you. That's strength and that's power. So let's think about that. Just some practical ways. Don't forsake the assembling together of one another. Be favorite, fervent at the Lord's table. Study the Scriptures. Pray without ceasing. Be a servant to one another. In all things, in all ways, keep the Lord the main thing of your life. That's drawing close to Him. And drawing close to Him will make you more powerful than you can believe. And if you don't, you're going to wake up one morning and the Philistines are going to be right on your doorstep. That's what happened to Israel. They were right there on the border of Judah. The Apostle Paul tells us, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, For whatever things were written in the past were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. This is Holy Scripture. The history, it's recorded here. And it tells us that your difficulty today, and we all have them, the giants out there, whatever that may be, have been providentially placed by God not to destroy you, not to ruin you. No. 
but that you might learn to fight by them. Man, your warfare is spiritual. And it is necessary for you to make you the man or the woman God would choose you to be, ultimately. That's what we're learning. That's what it's all about. Now, oftentimes, I think, what you and I, when we're unfaithful, and we are slothful, and we're not diligent and filled with zeal, we slide in to a period of losing perspective. What's this about? How did this come? 9-11, where was God? When these twin towers came tumbling down and all these people lost their lives, where was God? In God we trust. Where was He? In the same place that He always is. He is ruling over the affairs of mankind. But you see, unfaithfulness causes us to lose perspective on things. The giants are here in one form or another. Standing, as it were, in our way. Keeping us from being and doing what God would have us to do. And so we cry out, Psalm 10, in prayer. O oh Lord, why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Look at this powerful enemy. Verse 2, he's arrogant. Verse 3, he brags and he boasts. Verse 5, he's always successful in his endeavors. And in verse 6, his confidence puts us to shame because we know we can't match him in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, let's look at that verse in detail. The two, two key words. Psalm 10, verse 1. First, the word far off. It carries the notion of a distance, a spatial separation. Here's where it was used. Genesis 22, 4, where Abram saw Mount Moriah at a distance. That's the mountain that he was going to take his son Isaac to. That's the word far off. Here's the second key word. Hide. It's translated by the standard lexicon as to conceal. And its uses are quite remarkable. Psalm 90, verse 8. It's referred to Secret sins that men conceal or hide. But God sees them all. Uh, Psalm 26, verse 4, the people, the wicked thoughts are all concealed. They're hidden. Proverbs 28, 27, used to the fool who conceals his eyes. He looks away from the poor. Here's what I found so striking about this verb to hide. It's always about man. The subject is man. One way or the other, man is acting, man is conceive, uh, concealing, man is hiding everywhere. It's men's natural activity until you come to Psalm 10. And there we have an exception. The psalmist says, you've hidden. You're hiding. No. You've lost perspective. You've been unfaithful. 
The Lord has not departed. You have departed. You have lost your way along the way. You've grown cold and indifferent to the things of the Lord. The coming together to hear the Scriptures. The Lord's table. Prayer. Prayer for one another. Service one to another. You have set all of that aside. And look what God has brought into your life. A giant. In whatever form or fashion that he would be. And he's right on your doorstep. So, look, if that's the case, and that's the cause that's going on here, before we ever get to 1 Samuel 17, let's quickly adjust our way and return to our first love, the Lord, and confess your sins, renounce your slothfulness and your behavior, and watch how quickly the giants will disappear in front of you. They are not there to destroy you. They are there to teach you. This is how we fight. And this is our behavior always in every circumstance. Now, now I think we're ready for 1 Samuel 17. Verses 1 through 54. David, as we have learned in chapter 16, had already been chosen by God. He had been privately anointed by the prophet Samuel. In providence, he had, he had been uh, noticed by a random servant as a skillful player of the lyre. So as time has moved on, he has returned home and out of the immediate surface of the king. So what has been going on? Uh, it's very instructive. It's very practical for you and me. What's been going on is he's preparing you for the next thing. That's what's going on with you. He's preparing you for the next thing. And you're going to be victorious by trusting Him with it and living in it and not going around it, but through it because you're grown up and mature and follow the Word of God. The style here gives us much detail. Why? Because our historian, divine historian, is writing a dramatic event. He puts all of this into his storytelling. Chapter 16, we were geographically in Bethlehem and Gibeah, but now notice here, we are in a location called the Valley of Elah. That's verses 1 through 11. So the new location and verses 1 through 3 give us the geographical setting of that location. Here we have two armies, the Philistines and verse 2, the men of Israel. This is located specifically at Soka, S-O-C-O-H, some 14 miles west of of Bethlehem, which is an important detail. You wouldn't think that, but it is, because David is going to walk it, all 14 miles of it. That's a long trek. Notice Judah is mentioned with the word camp. In other words, the Philistines are right on the border. They've already taken over your front yard. They're now at the threshold 
of your door. Verse 1. You have the word gathered and you have it repeated in verse 2. Gathered and gathered. But there's a difference. One is in the active voice and one is in the passive voice. What does that mean? That means that the activity is applied to the verb. And if it's active, it means that their gathering was energetic. And if it's passive, which the Israelites were, well, all they did was show up. They didn't dig trenches. They didn't put out barbed wire. Nothing. They're just sitting there, pitching their tents. Verse 2, Israel has gathered. And so, verse 3, the point. The passive voice and the active voice tell us of the energy of the moment and what's going on. They're coming for you, Saul, and they're coming for Israel. Verse 4, and now the drum roll and the bright light in this corner, here he comes. Goliath of Gath. Woo! I mean, that, that, just, that name it just sounds big, doesn't it? Goliath of Gath. But interestingly, in all of this story, his name is only mentioned here and in verse 23. After that, he's referred to just simply as the article, the or Philistine. He is the champion. Now, this word only occurs here in all the Old Testament. Once spoken word. So it's hard really for scholarship to get its brain around this word. The best that they can come up with is it means he is between. He's between two forces. He's the bridge, if you will. You have the Israelites over here, you have the Philistines here, and you have this man in between. He is the man in the middle. We observe this verb came out. That's a movement verb. It prepares us for his intervention. Notice the word stood. And verse 8, I think the Scriptures give us really three descriptions of this foreboding giant. Here's the first, verse 4, that simply takes your breath away. Let me try to put it in our vernacular. He's t bigger than Shaquille O'Neal. He's just seven foot one. He's two feet taller than Andre the Giant, the late wrestler who was seven foot four. This man is nine feet tall. Goliath, the man in between. Here's the second description, verses 5 through 7. His weaponry. Lots of metal here. Mainly bronze. The Philistines had a monopoly on metalworks, so he has superior technology. Coat of mail, the NIV translated a coat of scale armor. It covers his torso, the breastplate, the vulnerable organs, the heart, the lungs. And we're told that that breastplate alone is 140 pounds. This guy's a human tank. <laughs> Verse 6, Braun grieves, protecting his shins. Verse 7, he never had to worry about anybody stealing his stuff. 
No, because nobody could use his stuff. You put on one of his jerseys and it covers to the floor. This bronze javelin is so large that it's carried on his shoulders, a spear, so enormous that one could hardly hold it, much less throw it. The tip of the spear is 15 pounds. Try throwing 15 pounds and see how far you get. And now, here's the third description. Look at that last sentence, verse 7. I think this is the subtlety of the historian. The shield bearer going before him. What does that mean? I think rather than describing the shield bearer coming first and Goliath behind him, I think it is he is looking at the back side of the shield bearer. In other words, this monstrous man with all of this metal is now looking out through his own helmet to the back side of the shield bearer. Peering out. Think he has any concerns? That's why I think it's a description. Gonna get him today, champ? What do you think? I don't think anything. I just, I just asking. <laughs> Saul tells David, First Samuel seventeen thirty three, is a trained warrior, invincible, a warrior from his youth. Verse eight. Here's his mind. We know his mind by what he says. So here's his mind. And listen to his voice. The man in between. He opens with a question. And it's a good question. It's a truthful question. Why have you come out? Indeed. Why have you come out? That's the important point of the passive voice. In gathered. They're not doing anything. Israel won a great victory at a place called Mitzvah. M-I-Z-P-A-H. In 1 Samuel 7.5. They blew the horn and they assembled the men for battle. You have no horns here. You have a bunch of guys pitching tents. There's nothing happening in the camp of Israel. Nothing. They wanted a king like all the other nations. 1 Samuel 9, 2. This Saul is taller than anyone else. So Israel has their big guy too, right? Where's he? He way back at the back in his royal tent. He's not looking at anything. 1 Samuel 10, 24, there was no one like Saul among all the people, but he was a, a no-show. And that's what happens. It's what happens when you believe and hope and think, oh, Man, this is, this is really what I need. This is the answer to everything. No. He's an empty suit. Oh, give us a king. Give us a king like all the other despots and tyrants and rulers of the earth. That's what we need. We need a man like that. Well, here is the bark of the Philistine. Select a man for yourself. Verse 9, if he can fight with me and defeat me, we shall become your slaves. But if you prevail and I defeat him, then you become our slaves and you serve us. 
That's a lie. That didn't happen. That does not happen. Uh, the Philistines are not going to bow their knee to Israel. So just know you cannot compromise with the world in anything, in anything. Verse 10, your translator may use the word defy. It's actually the word to challenge, and it's really a key word in this text. It occurs in verse 25, 26, 36, and 45. It is his utter contempt. So confident, so brash, so bold. He's not afraid of anything, and he shouldn't be, right? Such are the giants that God creates to put in your way. Well, Saul and all Israel, verse 11, had the full effect of the giant. Despaired, frightened. Let me give you one final word to their modus apprende. Frozen. They were frozen. They don't know what to do. My friends, what are we going to do with the giants in front of us? What are we going to do? This threatens us all. Destroys us all. Ruins our faith all. What are we about to do? Is there anyone, anywhere, anytime that can find us and help us? Oh Lord, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He's not hiding. He's going to bring his king to the battlefield. And he is going to be a king like no one suspected. And he is going to bring a deliverance that no one would anticipate. That's your God. That's what he's doing. He's setting the stage for his own victory, in which he alone will receive all the glory. What is God doing with you? He's doing the same. You've been hurt. You've lost loved ones. You have been estranged from family or friends. You've had discouragement financially. One thing after another. The giants are there. But God has you to walk through that battlefield and to win the campaigns of life by being faithful. Never run from the giants. Always trust God, believe His Word, and go straight ahead. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for your eternal word that leads, guides, and guards our life. And would you bring through the Scriptures great comfort to each and every one of us this morning that we are your children, the children of divine providence, and you will see us through. For you are a great king and a great God. In Jesus' name, amen.